What's up, guys? Elijah Scheidler here, owner and supervising broker of Venue Real Estate, and welcome to episode four of the V3 Summit podcast. V3 stands for Venue Vision Video, and as a real estate company, I'm not just pursuing brokering properties, but helping to build thriving community through collaborative commerce. Now, throughout this podcast series, I want to help to invite you into the vision of what I'm pursuing as a business owner here in the Bozeman community, while at the same time to empower you to be better equipped to pursue your life's goals. Now, a principle that constantly challenges me in business is that we're to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Now, What this means in practice then is that if my business philosophy and ethos is not immediately applicable for every other business member of my community and every member of my community to help them thrive and be successful in their life goals, then I'm not loving you as myself. I'm doing unto others what I would not want them to do to me and then have to put in place structures to hold competitors at bay. Now, ultimately, what this boils down to is keeping people from interacting with me the same way that I interact with them. (laughs) That's some interesting and very convicting commentary, isn't it? (laughs) The topic of discussion in today's podcast is going to be disembodied business practice and and their long-term effects on community. Now, what I just described to you is disembodied business practice, treating you in such a way that I distance myself from so as to be held outside of the negative impacts of my behavior. Now, taken to a deeper level, this is socially acceptable sociopathic behavior. Psychology Today defines sociopathy as a pattern of antisocial behaviors. Note that word, antisocial antisocial behaviors and attitudes, including manipulation, deceit, aggression, and a lack of empathy for others. Now, you'll be more familiar with this concept within its oft-repeated mantra of, it's not personal, it's, it's just business. Now, I find it interesting how we can feel revolting disgust for overt sociopathic behavior in serial killers and the like, But then we just shrug off the same behavior in lesser forms as acceptable. I love the quote from the classic movie, You've Got Mail, that highlights the issue with this longstanding statement. If you're not familiar with the movie, it's a modern day retelling of the classic Jane Austen book, Pride and Prejudice. Kathleen Kelly is played by Meg Ryan, and she owns a bookshop called The Shop Around the Corner. And she's put out of business by Joe Fox of Fox books played by the incomparable Tom Hanks. <laughs> Love that guy's acting. Now everyone keeps saying this phrase to Kathleen Kelly and, and it finally leads to the following exchange. Joe Fox, he, he says, it wasn't personal. What's that supposed to mean? I'm so sick of that. All, all that means is that it wasn't personal to you, but it was personal to me. It's personal to a lot of people. What's so wrong with being personal anyway? And then Tom Kank's character says, nothing. But but we know that there are consequences to being personal and authentic in business. And its most immediate forms are experienced in uncomfortable situations and (laughs) decreased earning potential. In general, People aren't looking for personal character development when they're engaging business. By way of a personal anecdote, I lost business this year precisely because of this. I stepped into confronting personal relational issues within business, and as an immediate and direct result, my business partners walked away from me. So so why share this example? It's not a very positive anecdote to help invite you into joining me into an embodied business practice of it's personal, it's not business. A couple podcasts back, I said, if you're not willing to die for your vision and embrace the suck necessary to make it a reality, it's not a vision. It's just an aspiration. And your vision will die as soon as it requires perspiration to achieve. Perspiration is the kryptonite of aspiration. Leaders 
they don't blow smoke up people's kilts and not paint a, a clear picture of the liabilities of pursuing vision. One, it's unfair to invite people into something without being honest about the risks. And two, without clarity in regards to the liability, if leaders launch into pursuing vision, the people that they're trusting to partner with them and entrusting their lives to, they're going to turn back as soon as the vision isn't fun and safe. Being personal and engaging real, authentic, relational connection with people in business is going to affect your bottom line in the short run. Now, if vision isn't focused on groaning in the moment, but growing in momentum, <laughs> compromising conviction in the moment for the sake of, of comfort and a commission is going to earn decreased momentum in your community for the future. So straight up being personal in business and not compromising in your convictions is, is going to cost you business. That's why we don't often see it as a mainstream practice. However, as I consider the long-term negative impacts of disembodied business practices, first, first on my own person, but then on the wider community, it's not worth the, the immediate trade-off of a higher earning potential in the moment. Applying this to, to, to many of our current social dynamics as a growing and expanding community here in Bozeman, I think you'll be able to see the long-term negative effects of disembodied business practices and that they don't lead to personal or community thriving. Another time-tested truth is that you reap what you sow. And nobody plants wheat expecting to get potatoes. You reap what you sow. Also, what you cultivate dominates. Now, if you've ever done gardening before, you know that weeds are the fastest growing structures in your garden. You have to know what the budding structures of your fruit bearing plants look like. And, and then you have to pull all of the weeds around them. You have to stay vigilant with your weeding too, so that the weeds root structures don't get too big and then uproot the fruit bearing structures when you try to pull the weed up right next to it. If you don't battle back the weeds, they'll suck up the nutrients and the light that the structure that you value needs to grow and to thrive. So, so you reap what you sow, and whatever you cultivate dominates. Now, unfortunately, I think we've got a bumper crop of weeds on our hands that are choking out the fruit-bearing structures of healthy Bozeman culture. Now, I'm going to be painting a picture of a longitudinal business interaction within the exchange of goods and services, and I'm going to be painting with super exaggerated stereotype details to help highlight the governing dynamics of these social structures that we're then going to pull back into their nuanced application. So, so don't get lost in the example. It's hypothetical and extreme, but apply the principles to the nuances of your given context and see if they apply. Now, to start off, though, real life example, this is real. And it's how this thought got planted in my heart and mind. As I talk to a lot of people who are moving here into the area, I ask them, what was the deciding factor for you moving here? And they'll, and they'll say something to the effect of, we've been coming to Bozeman for years to vacation, always love our time here. And after going home, seeing how crazy it's getting where, where we were, we finally said, why are, why are we doing this to ourselves? Let's just move to Bozeman, and here we are. You've probably heard something like this, or this may describe your actual process. Now, on the other side, again, real-life conversations. When I talk to a lot of locals, they'll say something to the effect of, I'm actually thinking about moving away. Bozeman, it's just not the same town anymore. There's so many people moving in, and that's not really a big deal, really. It's not my favorite, but it's that they're coming here expecting it to be like where they came from. hey oh, <laughs> you moved away for a reason, remember? <laughs> Again, I'm sure you've probably heard conversations that are very similar. Hopefully, though, you can see the dissonance in these two reports. You have people moving in, who said that they love Bozeman community and culture. They didn't like what they were experiencing and, 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 and where they lived. And they're moving here to be a part of the Bozeman community, yet, yet locals say that, that they're frustrated by the people coming from outside and expecting Bozeman to be the same as where they came from. Like, do you see the dissonance here? Like, 
this isn't logically consistent. And I think disembodied business practices play a large role into the lack of thriving as a community together here in Bozeman. Hypothetical example, John and Susie and their son, Tom, they, they've come here to vacation every summer in Bozeman, and, and they want to experience the best that Montana has to offer. So they go fishing in the morning, they go on trail rides in the afternoon, and then in the evening, experience the best that downtown Bozeman has to offer. And they're having the time of their life. Everyone's super nice, super interested in everything they have to say, laugh at all of their jokes, and they, they treat them like royalty. Now, after... 10 days of being around the nicest people that they have ever met, they head home and they're confronted by the harsh reality of real life. <laughs> people are rude, they're overbearing, they, they don't care about your stories or your jokes or your amazing vacation. We've got work to do, dude. Johnson's on line five, get back to work. Now, the issue is John, Susie, and Tom had an amazing time, but... Their fishing guide, the trail boss, their servers downtown, they all had a horrible time but made great tips. John's verbally abusive with everyone, including his son and his wife. He doesn't listen to anyone because he watched one YouTube video on it and is an expert about everything. Susie complains about her breakfast and compares it to Panera bread every morning. And then Tom complains the whole time that he doesn't have cell service to surface on, surf on his smartphone and can't manage his social media account. And then when he does have service, he, he complains about what a hick town Bozeman is because it doesn't have consistent 5G coverage everywhere. The problem is the people doing business with the Smiths don't confront any of this and, and they don't take anything personal because, hey, it's, it's not personal, it's business. If John's fishing guy confronted his bad behavior, he wouldn't get a $1,000 cash tip at the end of the week. Now, if the trail boss told everyone that they had to leave all of their phones at the bunkhouse, they probably wouldn't get a tip at the end of the day either, and the Smiths wouldn't come back next year while leaving a scathing review on Yelp. Now, remember, I'm painting a hypothetical example with super broad strokes to highlight a specific point. The short-term benefits of disembodied business practices lead to long-term negative consequences. Think about it. When the Smiths, they finally decide to make their, their destination summer vacation their permanent residence, they, they aren't deciding to be a part of Bozeman culture because they haven't ever experienced it. They were welcomed into our community. They brought some very disagreeable relational practices and weak character to our area for 10 days. And, and rather than meeting head-to-head -head with people with similar cultural practices, they met with people who just patted their heads and placated them for 10 days, not taking it personal in order to keep their business. If you don't make your money in the tourist season, you're not going to do well over the winter. So buck up buttercup, <laughs> it's business, not personal. Make the money, keep on smiling, just got to keep it up for 10 days, and then we can take the Smiths back to the airport and send them home. Now, <laughs> trouble is... The people that engage in these goods and services over and over and over and over, they come to believe that, that they love Bozeman and they move here permanently. Now, now, this is where locals get frustrated and say, like, you moved here because you said that you didn't like the culture from where you came from. Move to Bozeman, but leave what you didn't like behind. And there's, there's a problem here, though. This, this is a total bait and switch, and it's entirely unfair to the Smiths. This isn't the cultural value that business owners, guides, trail bosses, ski instructors, and service providers taught the Smiths for 10, 15, 20 years as they vacationed here. They just kept, kept on smiling, kept in place, and chanted their mantra, it's not personal is just business through gritted teeth and help the Smiths think that they could stay exactly as they were and be a part of Bozeman. That was the consistent 
culture cultivated into the Smiths for 20 years, and what you cultivate dominates. So when the Smiths move here, what, what do you think they're going to do? <laughs> they're going to come here, not change, and expect that everything that they engage as the statuses, roles, and norms of the culture that they left to be openly welcomed, supported, and served here in the Bozeman community without any resistance or confrontation. Wild, huh? Now, now who taught them that? Who taught them that they could move here and think that it was culturally acceptable in Bozeman to bring their culture here? Hmm. <laughs> now, remember, I'm painting a hypothetical situation with broad stereotype strokes and using exaggerated characterizations to make a point. So let, let me bring it back down to a specific personal application and throw myself under the bus. I want to lead through confession, not criticism. Like I mentioned in the last episode, I have a, a music degree. And a number of years ago, I led a volunteer music program here in the Bozeman community. And as I reached out to the participants with scheduling requests or to get input on elements of our programming, the communication was less than effective. People that wouldn't respond in a timely manner, and I would need their input in order to plan effectively, serve them as volunteers and the community that we were serving. And instead of pressing into confronting this, I started developing co communication around the dysfunctional culture. I, I would send out communication earlier and earlier, remind people with numerous texts. I'd send out communication that I knew that they would want to engage and then slide in elements of information gathering that I needed covertly. Dumb, absolutely idiotic. And eventually it blew up in my face. We had an upcoming performance in which I wasn't playing any instruments at all, but was only leading vocally. So was completely reliant on my ensemble. I sent out all the musical charts far in advance of our performance date and asked that everyone provide feedback on the elements to ensure that everything was in order. I didn't hear anything back, not a single word, and, and so said passively to myself, well, you had your chance, so we're just going to roll with what we have. Day of rehearsal comes. I have all of the charts printed out, transposed into everyone's keys that they need and so on. And as soon as everyone sits down, as soon as they sit down, they say, what's this? This isn't right. We can't use these. To say that I reacted poorly would be a compliment to myself. I absolutely blew my top. I, I sent all this stuff out. I asked for your input. Nobody got back to me. I'm just flowing and going. I'm all, all the way up to ramming speed with righteous indignation when a band member named Tim, he cuts me off mid-rant. Elijah, you are completely out of line, and, and I'd ask that you'd stop. Your behavior is not acceptable at all. I get it. You're frustrated. There, there could have been better communication, but that's no excuse for your behavior at all. And we found ourselves in a really bad situation. Your team is with you. You're the leader, and we're ready to follow you. I'd appreciate it if you'd apologize to your team and then let us know how you'd like us to proceed. The call is yours. Where are we going from here? Absolutely beautiful, astounding strength. And now, disregard personal responsibility for a second. Why was my team communicating the way they were with me? I, I had taught them that they could, and they had consistent instruction within the culture that I built that their communication was acceptable and supported by me. In, in the times when people would come and would say, sorry I didn't get back with you, I would say, oh, oh, it's okay, no problem. I'm sure you're busy. Why? <laughs> Why did I say this? Was it because it was okay? No, it wasn't okay. The lack of communication was draining and super frustrating. I said it was okay because I was afraid if I said, thank you for your apology. I, I really appreciate this. I've, I've been super frustrated by your lack of communication. And from here on out, 
I'd appreciate your proactive response to my request so, so as to be better able to serve you and the other members of the music volunteers. Why didn't I say this? Uh, it was because I was afraid if I was this personal and direct that people would get offended and not participate anymore. I, I introduced a quote in the last episode. If we all must suffer one of two pains, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. I was stepping off of the trail that led into the trial of discipline and onto the trail that led into the pain of regret. When I finally found that I couldn't hold my breath and tolerate the deformed culture that I had allowed to be built up through my compromised character, I exploded and I said the equivalent of, you moved here for a reason Leave your culture behind or go back to where you belong. <laughs> Tim, man, he stepped to the plate in, in gentle, courageous gentleness, though, and, and he confronted me. I love this. <laughs> in the moment, I didn't love it at all. I was absolutely livid. I was all the way up to ramming speed, and by cracky, I had a right to be upset. But did I? I didn't. Tim was absolutely right. He, he saw the storm coming, how, how it was engaging with the summit of my success, my, my personal peak performance. And he addressed the storm, but didn't abandon the climb. He put a hand on my shoulder to steady me. He called me back to the trail and said, the summit is that way. That we're following you. You're the leader. So inspire us. Tim's courageous gentleness is foundational to Bozeman culture, and I love this. Do you see what Tim did in my life? He complimented me in that I was a good leader, that he, he wasn't trying to subvert my leadership, but he confronted me in that I was behaving below my identity. I, I wasn't operating out of the peak performance or, or the summit of my personal success to serve others. Instead, I was using my position and privilege of power to beat people up. I, I like to think of fingerprints as topographical maps that are the calling cards of identity that we leave in the lives of those that we touch. Now, on a topographical map, that little swirl that's in the middle of your fingerprint would represent a peak or a summit, and its position in your fingerprint means it's unique to your identity. There's no one else who has your fingerprints. And so what this points to, I love that it's your finger. What this points to <laughs> is that each person has some area of peak performance or summit of success that stands out in their life above everyone around them. Now, I believe then it's our privilege to use this place of authority to elevate everyone around us in pursuit of their summit of personal success. Uh, Tim, he complimented the summit of success in my life in musical ability, but confronted me in not using it in a life-giving way towards those who were under my authority. He, he didn't attack me, try to tear me down. No, he, instead, he took the peak performance of his life, placed a hand on my back, and he gently guided me back to the trail that would help elevate everyone around me. His fingerprints are present at the scene of my climb. I'm so honored whenever I get to partner with him in life and in whatever we're doing. What if, what if the people who came and visited Bozeman on vacation left with such fingerprints glowing in their hearts? What if Mr. Smith's guide confronted him on his ignorance and arrogance in fly fishing while at the same time complimenting his passion by committing to help guide him into elevated excess through gifting him with firsthand expertise in a lifetime of fishing? What if, furthermore, what if he confronted him on, on his lack of respect that he showed to him, Mrs. Smith, and their son? What if the trail boss invited the Smiths into communing as a family within nature, opened up silence for personal reflection, and didn't allow them to bring any electronics on their trail ride? What if the Smiths felt the courageously gentle hand of a Bozemanite complimenting their person while confronting the misuse of its resource to serve those around them to thrive but then, instead of being cut off, 
had this person immediately say, now let me know how I can serve you. I'm watching. Climb on. The largest part of the world doesn't do relationships, friends, and especially not in business. They do utility. It's not personal. It's business. And and if you don't maximize my profits, you're wasting my time ranking and yanking. (laughs) If we courageously step into embodied business practices, people relating with people in the regulated exchange of goods and services that's personal, not business, will leave the calling card of Bozeman's identity in the lives of the people that we touch, the people that we serve. People, they won't forget this personal touch and they'll clearly know the identity connected to it. Then when people say, I long to belong to that culture, (laughs) they'll come with the heartbeat of Bozeman ready to serve everyone around them with the courageous gentleness of their own lives to see everyone in our community thrive. Now, with with this type of culture in place, those who are welcomed in as visitors, but then they decide to move home to belong, they're welcomed with a ready handshake bearing known, cherished, and valued fingerprints. These are the partnerships built on handshakes that supersede contractual law. Anybody will work for eight hours a day for a good wage and fulfill their contractual duty to not get sued. But people will kill themselves and bankrupt their lives in pursuit of vision that's built on love, honor, and belonging. Let's build another hypothetical story. The Smiths vacation in Bozeman for years and they're embraced with courageous gentleness. They've never had such a good, bad time in their lives. They've never felt so uncomfortable and confronted, yet comforted in in their entire lives. Even though they had super hard conversations, their fishing guide, Sam, tells John in front of his whole family at the airport, We had some hard conversations this week, but it was an absolute pleasure getting to serve you all. You're a good man, John, and I'm proud of how you stepped into character this week with your family. I hope that we get to see you guys again next year. You folks travel safe. After 20 years of this kind of cult, consistent cultural cultivation, clear across the entire valley, The Smiths grow uneasy in the town where they're from. When people say that they like you, you can't ever really tell because no one ever graciously tells you when they don't like you and stays connected with you. And then then if you do finally do something that they don't like, they cut you out of their lives and never interact with you again. Eventually, their hearts start to resonate with a longing to be where they're known and appreciated, where they're built up for who they are and whose they are, where where they live life within a community of people that they can trust to have their backs and entrust themselves to with confidence, knowing and being known. So then when Sam, the fishing guide, he finally gets a call from the Smith saying that that they've decided to move to Bozeman to make it their home, he's absolutely elated. Sam gives me a call and says, Smith told me that they're moving to Bozeman. Now, imagine yourself standing at the top of the escalator by the big metal bison, chatting with your friend at the airport, waiting with giddy excitement for the Smiths to arrive, to go look at houses that will best give them a place to belong in Bozeman. There's there's no handshakes here when they come out of security. It's hugs all around, pounding on each other's backs that mirrors the pounding of hearts that can't believe that Bozeman is welcoming a new peak of personal performance and summit of success to the range of resources that are already thriving in our valley. Can you feel that? (laughs) That's why I do what I do. Venue, a place to belong. A home is a lot more than just where you park your backside. (laughs) It's an entire ecosystem of inclusion, 
where your person is built up by those around you and, and appreciated in the resources that you release to build others up. Homes where you belong. And, and if you're looking for this, that's what I help people find. A place to belong. That's my vision. That's what I'm pursuing. And I'm willing to press through a lot of discomfort to protect, provide for, and promote this vision. This is Bozeman to a T, friends. And I'm so glad to be a part of the joy in the journey together, knowing and being known, being complimented for the value that I release into the lives of others through life-giving authority and, and being courageously confronted in areas where I step off the trail towards summits of success. It's not business, it's personal. Outside of people in relationships together, there is no such thing as business. We don't say that trees do business with rivers in the regulated exchange of goods and services. Like Brene Brown says, we can't selectively medicate the unpleasant things out of our lives. If, if we only engage what feels good and try to escape awkward, uncomfortable moments through sociopathic business practices, we'll see people moving to our region who, who think that they're moving home with no idea what it means to belong here. If I don't honestly, consistently, and courageously cultivate the cultural values of my hometown in the midst of doing business with people, I don't have any room to complain and blow my top when people move here and do exactly what I taught them to do. That's on me. <laughs> Hope that you're built up and inspired for whatever you have ahead of you. Friends, do good, be well, and I'll see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.